Saturday, January the 1st, 1983. New Year's Day. These are my New Year resolutions. 1. I will revise for my O-levels at least two hours a night. 2. I will stop using my mother's buff puff to clean the bath. 3. I will buy a suede brush for my coat. 4. I will stop thinking erotic thoughts during school hours. 5. I will oil my bike once a week. 6. I will try to like Bert Baxter again. 7. I will pay my library fines, 88 pence, and rejoin the library. 8. I will get my mother and father together again. 9. I will cancel the Beano. Sunday, January the 2nd. Took stock of my appearance today. I have only grown a couple of inches in the last year, so I must reconcile myself to the fact that I will be one of those people who never get a good view in the cinema. My skin is completely disfigured. My ears stick out and my hair has got three partings and won't look fashionable whichever way I comb it. Monday, January the 3rd. Negotiations are going on between my parents for a return to their married state. My mother said, But how can it ever work, Adrian? There is so much to forget. I suggested hypnosis. Tuesday, January the 4th. More negotiations behind closed doors. As he left, I asked my father for a report on the meeting. He said, No comment, and got in his car. Wednesday, January the 5th. Negotiations have broken down. I heard the sugar bowl crashing to the kitchen floor, then raised voices, then the door slamming. Thursday, January the 6th. A message was passed to an intermediary, me, that fresh negotiations would be welcomed. The message was passed on, and the response was favourable, so it was left to me to arrange time, venue, and babysitting details. Friday, January the 7th. The meeting took place in a Chinese restaurant at 8pm. Negotiations went on throughout the evening and were only adjourned when one party returned home to feed the baby. Saturday, January the 8th. Both parties have issued the following bulletin. It is agreed that Pauline Monica Mole and George Alfred Mole will attempt to live in mutual harmony for a trial period of one month. If during that time Pauline Monica Mole, hereafter known as PMM, and George Alfred Mole, hereafter known as GAM, break the following agreement, then the agreement shall be declared null and void and divorce proceedings will automatically follow. The Agreement 1. GAM shall cheerfully and without nagging or reminding do his rightful share of household tasks. 2. PMM shall keep her side of the bedroom in a hygienic and presentable condition. 3. Both parties to go to the pub at Sunday lunchtimes. 4. The children of the marriage, Adrian and Rosie Mole, to be given fair and equal attention from both parents. 5. Financial matters to be discussed each Friday night at 7pm. 6. A separate bank account to be opened for PMM. 7. Neither party to indulge in flirtation, seduction or adultery with the opposite sex without the full knowledge or consent of the other party. 8. PMM to replace cap on toothpaste after use. 9. GAM to wash own handkerchiefs. 10. Both parties to have unlimited freedom for the pursuit of hobbies, political interests, demonstrations and social intercourse outside the home. 11. GAM to throw both pairs of cavalry twill trousers away. 12. PMM will not constantly harp on Doreen Slater episode. GAM will not do the same re Lucas episode. Signed on this day, the 8th of January 1983, Pauline Mole, George Mole, A Mole, first witness, Rosie Mole, second witness. Her mark, X. Sunday, January the 9th. My father burnt his cavalry twills in the back garden today. As he poked the gobs of burning cloth, he said, Well, it's the straight and narrow for me from now on. I don't know whether he meant his life or his trousers. Monday, January the 10th. 
Lousy, stinking school started today. Everybody was flashing their new calculators around. My sheepskin caused a bit of a stir wherever it went, and it went everywhere. It is far too valuable to leave in the cloakroom. Pandora and I held hands in assembly, but were spotted by Mr. Scruton. He said, Keep your silly adolescent courtship rituals to outside school hours. Pandora was still upset at break, but I comforted her in the boys' toilets by explaining that Mr. Scruton was probably impotent and it enraged him to see young lovers who were brimming with Eastern promise. Tuesday, January the 11th. Saw Roy Hattersley on the television tonight. He is putting weight on. He ought to go on a diet in case there's a general election. The viewers don't like fat politicians. Look what happened to Churchill after the war. He was slung out because he got too fat. I know all this because we had a film of the Second World War in history today. I might be a historian, if my memory improves. Wednesday, January the 12th. Nigel has formed a gay club at school. He is the only member so far, but it will be interesting to see who else joins. I noticed Brainbox Henderson hovering around the poster looking worried. Thursday, January the 13th. Mr Scruton has ordered the closure of the gay club, saying that he and the school governors couldn't sanction the use of the school gym for immoral purposes. Nigel pretended to be innocent. He said, But sir, the gay club is for pupils who want to be frisky, frolicsome, lively, playful, sportive, vivacious or gamesome during the dinner break. What is immoral about gaiety? Mr Scruton said, Nigel, the word gay has changed its meaning over the past years. It now means something quite different. Nigel said, What does it mean, sir? Scruton started sweating and messing about with his pipe and not answering. So Nigel let him off the hook by saying, Sorry, sir, I can see that I will have to get an up-to-date dictionary. Friday, January the 14th. Must go and see how Bert is getting on. God, I wish I'd never got involved with him. He's like an ancient mariner around my neck. Saturday, January the 15th. There is a new joke craze sweeping the school. In my opinion, these so-called jokes are puerile. I watch in amazement as my fellow pupils roll helplessly in the corridors with tears of laughter coursing down their cheeks after relating them to each other. 1. Question. What do you call a man with a seagull on his head? Answer. Cliff. 2. Question. What do you call a man with a shovel in his head? Answer. Doug. 3. Question. What do you call a man without a shovel in his head? Answer. Douglas. 4. Question. What do you call an Irishman who's been buried for 50 years? Answer. Pete. 5. Question. What do you call a man with 50 rabbits up his bum? Answer, Warren. Come back, Oscar Wilde. Your country needs you. Sunday, January the 16th, 6pm. My father put on his new straight leg jeans today. He looks dead stupid in them. Talk about mutton dressed as lamb. He looks like stewing steak dressed as flash fry. I had to look after Rosie while my parents swanned down to the pub. I was also in charge of the pork and roast potatoes and switching on the greens. I fed Rosie okay, but it took ages to get her wind up. I patted her back for ages, but it wasn't until I turned her upside down that she burped. I pretended not to notice that her nappy needed changing and acted surprised when my mother pointed out that there was a yucky smell in the room. 10pm. Now I come to a difficult entry. How exactly do I feel about my father's return home? It's been a week now, and I've had plenty of time to think about it, but they've had these reconciliations before and they've ended in tragedy. So I think I'll reserve my judgement until the slopping has stopped and they're back to normal. 12.15am. Why didn't I go and see Bert? Why are you such a ratfink, Mole? Monday, January the 17th. Breakfast telly started today. I got up at 5.45am so I wouldn't miss history in the making. I made breakfast for me and the dog and took it into the lounge. 
Normally, cornflakes are banned from the lounge on account of the odd one falling out of the bowl and sticking to the carpet, but I felt sure my mother wouldn't mind on this special occasion. The dog fouled things up a bit by trampling into its bowl and scattering pedigree chum and winner lot into the shag pile, but I scraped the worst of the mess up with an empty fag packet and we settled down to wait for 6.30. At 6.25, I woke my parents up by shouting loudly up the stairs that breakfast television was starting. My father shouted loudly down the stairs that he didn't want to see bloody Frank Boff at 6.30am in the morning and that he'd break my neck if I didn't turn the volume down. Rosie woke up and started crying. I got the blame for that, and what with all the rowing and screaming, I missed the very beginning. This is just my luck. I enjoyed the horoscopes, the news, the celebrities and Frank Boff. He looks a steady sort of bloke. I wouldn't mind having a father like him. But best of all was Selina Scott, with her ravishing looks and quicksilver brain. Courtney Elliott joined me in front of the screen at 7.45am. He pronounced it lacking in intellectual fibre and said he would stick to listening to Radio 4 on his headset. I was late for school because Frank wasn't allowed to open the champagne until nearly nine o'clock. I have written to the Director General to complain. Dear Sir, I wish to convey to you my congratulations on your new programme, Breakfast Time. I saw the first episode and I thought it was a remarkable achievement considering. However, me and my fellow pupils were late for school due to the late opening of the champagne. Either this shows a flagrant disregard for your teenage audience or a woeful ignorance on your part of the time I and my cohorts have to arrive at school in the morning. I suggest, sir, that you do your research rather more thoroughly. Finally, can I make a plea that in future episodes, any special items, i.e. Ernest Hemingway chatting about his latest book, or Princess Diana having her horoscope read, will take place before 8.30am, except on Fridays when we don't have assembly. Thanking you in anticipation of a reply, your most obedient servant, A. Mole, aged 15 and 9 months. Tuesday, January the 18th. Lord Franks has published his report on the Falklands War. But I will make no further comment until I have studied today's Guardian editorial on the matter. 10.30pm. Can't find Guardian. It's not in its usual place in the dog's basket. Wednesday, January the 19th. Found Guardian in dustbin wrapped round yesterday's supply of disposable nappies. I made strong objections to my mother. Her feeble excuse was that she'd run out of plastic pedal bin liners. Thursday, January the 20th. Selina Scott is haunting my dreams. Last night she was walking down our street selling cucumbers door to door. I bought half a dozen with a £50 note I had in my wallet. She smiled shyly and said, Prithee, how old are you, sire? I answered, I be fifteen years, pretty maid. Then the dog jumped on my face and woke me up. I tried to tell my mother about my dream, but she refused to listen. She said, There's only one thing more deadly boring than listening to other people's dreams, and that is listening to other people's problems. Friday, January the 21st. Last night, Selina Scott and I were rowing the Atlantic single-handed. Selina fell overboard and was swallowed by a dolphin. I swam into the dolphin's belly and joined Selina. It was quite cosy. We had a glass of champagne, then swam out and got back into the boat where we found Frank Boff teaching Pandora how to read out football results. I told my father every detail of my dream, what Selina was wearing, etc., but I could tell he wasn't really interested. Now I know why people pay to go to psychiatrists. They are the only people who will listen. Saturday, January the 22nd. No Selina this morning, so I had to make do with going into town with Pandora, who wanted to buy a pair of neon pink leg warmers. After trekking round 50 shops, while Pandora sneered at inferior pinks and rejected them all, I suggested we went for a cup of coffee. While I scraped the froth off, I confessed to Pandora how I felt about Selina. Pandora took it very calmly. She said, Yes. Selina Scott is to be congratulated. Not many women could have borne the pain of so much plastic surgery. According to Pandora, Selina has had her nose, mouth, breasts, ears and eyes remodelled by the surgeon's knife. 
Poor Selina has to spend three hours in the makeup chair in order to disguise the operation scars. And Dora went on to say, Of course, she booked into the clinic under her real name, which is Edna Grubb. I asked Pandora how she got her insight into the lives of the famous. Pandora stubbed her cigarette out and said, My family used to be on intimate terms with a high up in the BBC. I asked who? A window cleaner? I said it quietly because Pandora had got into one of her moods. We resumed our search, but none of the leg warmer shops had neon pink, so Pandora is getting an away day and going to London to buy some. She said, God, how I hate the wretched provinces. Sunday, January the 23rd. Ratfink Lucas rang up today. I told him that my mother was at the pub with my father. He asked me which pub, so I told him. But instead of ringing off, he asked me loads of questions about Rosie and even asked me to bring her to the phone so that he could hear her gurgling. I told him that she was a late developer and was still at the screaming stage. Then Lucas said a weird thing. He said, That's my girl. My mother came home in a bad mood, and my father came home in an even worse mood. It seems that my mother had left the pub's darts match at a crucial point in order to answer a telephone call. Monday, January the 24th. The water workers have gone on strike, so my father made us all have a bath tonight, the dog included. Then he went around collecting containers and filling them up. While he was doing it, he was whistling and looking cheerful. My father loves a crisis. Tuesday, January the 25th. Fabulous, amazing, brilliant, magic. Showers have been banned at school. The twice-weekly torture of displaying my inferior muscle development is over. I hope the water workers prolong the strike until I've left full-time education. They should stick out for £500 a week, in fact. Wednesday, January the 26th. Courtney Elliott has offered to give me private tuition for my O-levels. It seems he is a doctor of philosophy who left academic life after a quarrel in a university common room about the allocation of new chairs. Apparently, he was promised a chair and didn't get it. It seems a trivial thing to leave a good job for. After all, one chair is very much like another. But then I am an existentialist to whom nothing really matters. I don't care which chair I sit in. I am reading On the Road by Jack Kerouac. Thursday, January the 27th. Ken Livingston was on the telly tonight, talking about his triumph in getting the High Court to cut bus fares in London. This led to me asking my parents for the bus fare to get to school. I am tired out by the time I have walked a whole mile in the morning. My father said that he used to walk four miles to school and four miles back through wind, rain, snow, hail and broiling sun and fog. I said sarcastically, though wittily, what strange climatic conditions prevailed in the Midlands in the 1950s. My father said, weather was weather in those days. You wouldn't know proper weather if it came up and smashed you in the face. Friday, January the 28th. I reminded my father that the law about seatbelts comes into force on Monday. He said, Nobody makes George Mole wear a baby harness. My mother said, A policeman will, so belt up. Saturday, January the 29th. Bert Baxter rang to ask why I hadn't been round. I said I'd been too busy. Bert said, yes, too busy to visit an old lonely widower. I promised to go round tomorrow after dinner. Bert said, dinner? What's that? I said, you remember, Bert, it's meat and three veg and gravy and stuff. Bert said that it was so long since he'd eaten properly that his vocabulary was suffering. I asked him round for dinner tomorrow and told him that my father would give him a lift. But when I told my parents, they went mad and said that they'd arranged to visit some properties tomorrow and were planning to get a Chinese takeaway. Properties? Why didn't they consult me? After all, it is my O-level year and it is most important that I suffer no violent change, trauma or neurosis. Sunday, January the 30th. Spent Sunday afternoon reading the news of the world out loud to Bert. I was amazed at how many vicars are leaving their flocks and running away with attractive divorcees. 
I also read him a few bits from the Sunday Times colour supplement. But Bert stopped me, saying, Do you think I'm interested in bleeding Italian furniture or a day in the life of a sodden piano player? I said, I think you ought to keep up with modern cultural patterns. Bert said that whenever he heard the word culture, he reached for his bottle opener. At 7pm, Bert's age-concerned volunteer turned up to take Bert to the pub. He is a thin, nervous-looking man called Wesley. Sabre growled and bared his horrible fangs when he came into the room. Bert said, Don't make any sudden moves, Wesley. Sabre's bite is worse than his bark. I couldn't resist showing off by throwing Sabre about and tickling his belly. I even did my party trick of putting my head in Sabre's mouth. I didn't leave it in long, though. Sabre's breath stank of cheap dog meat. After Wesley and Bert left, I tidied up a bit. I found Bert and Queenie's wedding photo under Bert's pillow. Funny to think that old, smelly, unattractive people can be sentimental. Monday, January the 31st. On the way to school, me and Nigel had a dead good time signalling to car drivers who had forgotten to put their seatbelts on. Hardly any of them thanked us.